All right, people cool if I go ahead and kick into this? Right on time, everybody okay with that? Looks like we got a lot of seats full. Thank you guys so much for coming down um, to talk. I'm John, I'm gonna talk about machine learning. I know you could be at Sandy's talk right now, um, so I appreciate you coming down to this instead. Sandy will be great on video. Uh, she's a wonderful person, and I know that I have to deliver at least as much value as you would have gotten out of Sandy's talk. So you set a pretty high bar for me, and I appreciate it, and I hope I don't let you all down. So what's our goal? My goal, I like one takeaway. Three takeaways is great, one takeaway is even better. I wanna use Ruby to answer questions about your users and your business. That's my goal, we're gonna use machine learning to do it. There's some chairs down here, guys, if you wanna go ahead and grab them and scoot them around somewhere. Um, we put them around the back, something like that. This room's set up kind of funky. Um, so I've got a question for all of you. This is gonna be interactive for a bit. How many people have a user's table in their Rails app? Okay, this is a better question. How many people don't have a user's table? All right, yeah. Uh, I'm just curious, what, what's the God object in your table? Or in your app, instead of users? Assets. Sorry? Asset. Asset, okay, that one makes sense. What else? Assets or users, so um, machine learning for fun and profit with your users table, sorry, assets and uh, you know some things like that. You'll probably find the same techniques apply, but everybody's got a user table, which is what started this thing out. Now, what, what is the goal of your all's business? Anyone, just shout it out. What is the real goal of your business? Make money, thank you, thank you. So we got users and we got the profit, right? Um, who's got a plan for making money from their users? Yeah, I just need to raise your hand. All right, you are first, so I'm going to just put you on the spot. What, what's your plan? How do you turn users into profit? So we give loans to users, and then they pay off uh, the loans plus interest. Awesome. I understand that business plan. That is awesome. So, um, so we, we uh, take, take uh, loan, people pay off the loans. We make money on that profit. That's awesome. Who works for a social network type company that's going to monetize the attention economy of the, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, okay, yeah, for sure. Um, I've done that too. And so that, that's what kind of frames this story for me because we're probably all familiar with people with that plan, right? We've got users. We want to make a profit. Everyone knows the underwear gnomes, our friends, the underwear gnomes. And, you know, there's that wonderful part where the gnomes explaining to the South Park boys that uh, step two is, you know, this big question mark after they collect the underpants and they're gonna make profit. And it's just strange to speculate on what business models actually you could build by collecting underpants and using machine learning on underpants to create profit. But we're not gonna do that today. We're gonna to figure out how to fill in that bit, how to fill in that question mark. The stuff that's in your user's table right now that you can use to turn into money, um, or hopefully some kind of money. We're gonna use a uh, particular set of tools, Ruby, which everybody here is probably pretty familiar with. We already talked about how everybody's got a user's table. Um, almost everybody, sorry, sorry, almost everybody's got a user table. And we are going to use science. So um, I'm a big fan of science. I was a chemist in another life, so I like that. Um, but science can take you down a bad path. So I wanna be sure that when we're thinking about the data science we're gonna do today, that we're a little less this crazy guy, um, the professor, I think this is from the third movie of Back to the Future. And we're a little more kick-ass science guy. Neil deGrasse Tyson is my, one of my favorite guys in the world. So um, we're going to use our user's table to figure out how to make a profit with data science. And we're going to try to do it thinking more kick-ass like Neil deGrasse Tyson than crazy like, like that. So real quick, the obligatory, that's me. Um, I'm John Paul Ashenfelter. I work here at Treehouse. Um, I asked earlier, but how many fans of Treehouse? A few? Okay, before that I worked at General Assembly, so I've got two of the, the big ones taken care of. So I'll probably go over to Dev Boot Camp and get a job there next so I can just continue collecting, working for education companies. I've got Treehouse stickers for anybody that wants them up here because we do have pretty cool uh, branding. You can come get Mike the Frog or you can come get, I gotta say we've got, they sent me these. I really have no clue what a boat is for Treehouse, but it's wonderful, so you can have one of those if you wish. But more importantly, why should you care about me and data science and being someone to tell you? I've been doing this for a long, 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 long time. Um, these, you can't see too many details, but this is from 2006. 
Um, I started the data warehousing track, um, which is another kind of data science at the MySQL conference. I taught it a lot at O'Reilly's Open Source Convention. And you can see what I highlighted here, because it's just funny to go back and look at what you know, just about 10 years was. We were talking about big databases that were in the 10 to 100 gigabyte range. Okay, I mean, that's just, that's just huge. It was hard to figure out how you stored data that big in those times. Um, who's got a database bigger than 100 gigs? Just curious. Yeah, a fair handful of people. Uh, bigger than a terabyte? We have Facebook here with their exabyte data. I don't think there's any Facebook people here because they're all PHP, right? So, but anyhow, data has changed a lot. Um, and uh, that means the tools have changed a lot. Just one more quick uh, digression from the history of me. You can't see everything there, but when I started doing this, I actually started with neural networks back in grad school. Um, or actually, undergrad, to be honest, I started with neural networks. And you can't see it over here, but down at the bottom here, it says for MS-DOS. So we did Visual Basic with no number for MS-DOS, and we had to buy a uh, math coprocessor for the computers we ran it on, because you know the 386 math coprocessor was an additional cost, and you slotted it in, and all of a sudden your math got better. Um, because most of the time when you were running numerical simulations, back in those days, it was kind of like this. You pressed play, and you waited for, um, on average, uh, you know, two, three hours. I had some runs that took three days between data points, literally three days. Um, and that's changed a lot. So I've been doing this for a long time. Ironically, someone who started like a lot of things like this at exactly the same time, um, the month I started my research project, this was the cover of uh, Inc. Magazine. So just saying, um, there was some interesting stuff going on at that time, that far more interesting than what I was doing. Data science, this is our format. We're gonna start with a problem and some data, and we're gonna do some stuff with code to get some kind of results. We're gonna learn something about our users, and we're gonna use that to make money. I started this as the machine learning for fun and profit. Um, as I've been doing a lot more of this and thinking about it a lot more, I've started to think a lot more about it like storytelling. Storytelling what's going on with, in my case, in our case for these examples, storytelling about your users, because I think stories are a much more powerful metaphor. So this is sort of arranged into stories. And we're going to start where people like to start, with simple stories. Stories you tell around the campfire, stories you tell to make people happy, stories you tell to teach people things, stories that we all love and enjoy. So I'm going to ask a question. Um, who knows who their users are? Do any of you actually really work with your users table? You know, maybe you're in marketing. Maybe you're in, um, you know, the business dev side, maybe you're very, many people really feel like they know who their users are. So yeah, so no, no one's willing to say, I do, I know my users. Um, that's probably because you've got a lot of them, right? You know, it's easy when you've got five or 10 users. I mean, I, you know, I literally look out in here and I can't count how many people there are because you know, your mind goes one too many, um, you know, and it's kind of gone, so it's hard. I will tell you one thing I bet all of you know about your users. How many people are familiar with thinking about your users like that? Right, you know, Google Analytics, Heap, Mixpanel, um, Kiss, any of these things. You're used to thinking about your users like that, which is another way of saying thinking about your users like that, right? They're all exactly the same person. And then what do you do? Well, you take that and you aggregate it. And honestly, if you, if you look at a typical Google Analytics dashboard, about the only thing in there that tells any sort of story is we've got a lot of people in North America in this one. I mean, it's a little more of a story. I could guess, you know, I can tell a story looking out at you guys. There's a lot of white guys with facial hair. There's more women than there used to be here. Um, we're missing all of the people with colored hair. You know, I mean, I can notice a few things about this, but, um, you know, it's very superficial data, much like, you know, that Google Analytics dashboard showing me, hey, you know, we got a lot more traffic from the U.S. So this is what our users look like. And we add things up about users. We use vanity metrics. We've got you know, 10 gabillion users. The users spent so, so much. You know, this is what we can do. We roll them up into aggregates all the time. All right, now, aggregates are okay. But um, they really don't tell the whole story. Aggregates tell you about your average user. How many of you all dream of being the average user of a company? Really? No one wants to be the average user of a company? Um, I mean, you know, we all know that, you know, everybody's not a special snowflake. We've been hearing that over and over and over. You know, we should all have the same tools. Everybody wants to feel special, though, regardless, you know, of, of how we're looking at the data. So that means we need to tell good stories. Aggregates are boring. 
Um, SQL DBAs from the past, people who deal with reports, any of, anyone? Anyone? Right, that's why you're Ruby Dev, so you don't have to do SQL and reports and all those things. That's for the Java guys running BERT and the people who are using Crystal Business Objects, whatever it's called this week, and Oracle, um, in a world most of us don't live in. But um, aggregates can tell more of a story. They can then turn into events in motion that are more interesting. Seeing aggregates over time is wonderful, being able to press the play button and see data change over time, seeing your users grow over time, your number of tweets grow over time, your, uh, your uh, cache base grow over time. And then context makes it interesting. So there's a lot of questions where you wanna know things about the context. And when you're putting all those things together, you're telling stories. So I was thinking that there is some users in my database and the users in my database spent good money at my company. And then I thought, I wonder how many of them are female. And then I had a revelation, right? I'm trying to do Ira Glass's storytelling, which no one does as well as Ira Glass. This is a napkin representation of the storytelling that America, this American life does. Something happened, then something happened, then something happened. Oh my God, insight. Something happened, something happened, something happened. Oh my God, more insight. And you know, if you've ever listened to This American Life, uh, you, you learn stuff about it. They're telling individual stories, and then you come up with some better picture, some better understanding, some insight to guide your life. Morning Edition does it in a similar way. The big V there is after their intro, they go way down into the trough to talk about all the details. And then they come back out of the trough, and they say, well, we talked to John Ashenfelter about this, and we talked to Avdi Grimm about this, and we talked to this other person about this to put it back into human context. There are different ways of telling stories. And there's the, the very internet way, which is still a good way to tell stories because you all click on stuff like this, seven unbelievable facts about your users, click here for more. Um, so, you know, I mean, the, all these things are ways people want to hear about data. So, your users, what do you know? How do you know it? What's missing? This might be what your users look like. You've got some vague outline of them in your head. How do you find out more about your users? If you right now wanted to know, let's, let's keep going with the male-female distribution. If you want, how many people collect that right now, like, like actually ask in registration or something? How many? So not many, not many. How would you figure it out? Just holler out. If you needed to know for whatever reason what the male-female ratio was of your population, go ahead and holler it out. Name analysis, wow, that would be a good one. If only someone was doing a talk at this conference on name analysis, thank you. Um, there's, there's nothing paid for that. Um, what's the traditional way to do it? Ask them, how do you ask them? Surveys, surveys thank you. How, how, does anyone know what survey percentages are like? Have you ever done a survey through SurveyMonkey or something like that? Yeah, are, are you gonna get them? Yeah, go ahead. They're tiny, they are, they are. And that's assuming that people open the email in the first place, which is more than likely how you shift it out. So you're multiplying tiny numbers, which leads to even tinier numbers. And you end up with very small data sets that you extrapolate from and hope that they're somehow relevant, hope that they're somehow statistically significant. And there are statistical techniques for dealing with that. But wouldn't it be better if you had more confidence, knew more about your users? Descriptive data lets you um, slice your users into segments, right? Um, you can use things like lookup tables to do this, um, which we're going to do in a second. You can do, uh, you can do uh, the name analysis, which we're going to do in a second. Most of these are fast, easy to do. They're going to give you way better results. So if I said I could give you like 80% accuracy on male and female based on first name, uh, male and female gender based on first name, who thinks that's worse than what they get from a survey? Right, yeah, I mean, it's at least as good as what you're gonna get from a survey, you know, probably better. And uh, it takes very little time and effort. So that's one thing I'm gonna send you home with today. So let's talk about it. This is one of the first examples we're gonna do. And we're gonna see how these examples go. Um, the first two, I know you can do without any sort of, of uh, any, any uh, crazy gems or any linear algebra or anything like that. So yeah, the gem's called Sex Machine. I, I did not write it. Um, so uh, this is literally the code. You know, you're selecting all your users by first name. And then we're gonna take the sex machine gem and, uh, and analyze it. And so let's run through code real quick and then we'll do the code. We'll see, see if that works. How many people sort of got gems installed so far? Okay, so there should be at least someone nearby that you can kind of see. And so I'm gonna explain it. We're gonna take a minute to do it. Maybe while people are doing it, you can try one more network to see if you can get the gems installed from the repo 
and we'll go with it. But so basically, Sex Machine is, is pretty trivial, and I'll tell you a little bit about what's under the hood. So you create a detector. There's a couple of cool things you can do. There's case sensitivity, so you know most people don't want to do case sensitivity. You can also pass it uh, locales um, because different names are masculine or feminine in different locales. How many people are British in here, UK British? Okay, just, just the British people and, and the US people, think to yourself your answer, okay? The name Jamie, boy or girl, British people? Boy, US people? Girl, right. I mean, it's not certain, right? Jamie's a little bit of an androgynous name, but in Great Britain, it is far more boy than girl. In the US, it is far more girl than boy. So this library understands some of those things if you want to, uh, to uh, lock it to, uh, particular, to particular regions. So um, basically, we've got this detector, which we're, gonna, which we're gonna create from the sex machine gym. And we are going to basically get the gender of names. That's literally all this gym is. Now that's a lot easier even than putting together a Wufu survey and sending out an email to all your users. And honestly, later on, you can check how right it is if you wanna send out a survey, if you need better statistics. So that is literally all there is to the sex machine gym. I'm gonna tell you just a bit um, about where it came from, because you should always question these black boxes, right? We've got this black box that you put a name in and you get a gender out. Now, for all you know, it's random, right? You know, um, <laughs> hopefully it's not random. So what, what is interesting about this, Jim, is the data is seven years old. It's a collection of 40, 42,000 names, I think, um, that uh, some guy in Germany did by checking census data from all sorts of different companies. It's uh, got uh, percentages by country, and it's packaged up because, God forbid I use a gem that's pure Ruby in this talk, it's packaged up in a C extension, and so the sex machine gem wraps the C code that has all the names in it, but it's very easy to muck about with this gem, um, and it runs really quick. So let's do our first exercise. There's two files if you look in the exercise one gender thing in this repo, and I'll put the repo thing up again for people that might not have it. Check your gender lets you check your own gender, um, so you can put your name in it. You can see some of the unusual ones. I have a couple of questions just before you see the results of it. I, I have liter I polled friends that have children with unusual names. Okay, so I want to know male or female when I holler these names out. Cedar. Okay. Uh, River. <laughs> Justice. Inter you know, it, it's just fascinating, right? Because, you know, um, I, I'll say, because those are all in the check your gender file, because that one I, was, I put together, just put your name in it and to put some other examples. You can see what, what uh, Sex Machine has to say about those. Those are all true stories. Friends of mine all have children named those various things. So, um, and then the assigned gender to users, so there's this ongoing story that we can tell through what's in this database. There's a machine learning, there's a SQLite file, so it's not hard. I would encourage you, if you've got a slice of your users table on your local machine, to go ahead and hook it up to your local machine. You know, use the Postgres gem, use the MySQL gem. If you wanna take this and actually run it against your real data right now, there's no reason you have to use mine. But I gave you a set of data. I pulled a bunch of the people that work at Treehouse. I, uh, I dumped out some of the personal data, but I kept their name and I ran, the, uh, ran that into a, a SQLite database so it was easy to distribute. And that assigned gender to users file is actually more of a read from the database, pick a gender, write it out. So what I want to do is see how it works for us going ahead and trying that. We're going to try it maybe for about five to ten minutes. This one's not too hard, so it's either going to run or it's not going to run. You either have the gym down or you're not, and the Wi-Fi is going to kill you. And let's just see what happens. So is everybody cool with that plan? All right, well, let's take five minutes to start, and then we'll go a few more and see if we can get either check your gender and assign a gender. I would be particularly interested when you do the first one if you feel really upset about what it tells you you are. Um, I usually go by John Paul because there's so many Johns at most of the companies I work at, and it says I'm androgynous. So I guess it's because I have two names. Um, but if I do John or Paul, obviously it says I am masculine. So it'll be interesting to see what it says for you, um, especially if your name is Justice uh, or River or Cedar um, or something like that. So um, yeah, let's, let's give it a shot um, and see how this goes. This is the, the your time to do something. So I'll go ahead and show some code up here. Okay, so this is what we got. So 
So that's the assigned gender to users. Hang on, let me get the other one. Uh, what's the other one called, the other ones? So check my gender. Um, all these you can just run in Ruby from the command line if you've got it. You can just Ruby these, these files. So you can put your name here. Your name here, by the way, is androgynous as well. If you actually run it just like this, it'll tell you your name here is androgynous. Um, test user one is androgynous. Test user 10 is androgynous. I learned a lot about, um, about what is an androgynous name looking through some of the junk data in our, uh, in our tables. So anyhow, let's give it a shot. Yes, sir. Yeah, sorry, I'll bring the repo up too. Do, do, do. The repo is right there. So let's see how this works. Nothing like live coding with all of you. So let's see how it works. In case you, in case you really want to know, like the before and after are in there. All the code is there. It's no big deal if it doesn't work for you or if you don't want to do it right now or whatever. It's got the before and after, so you've got this, so you can take it back. You can hook it into your user's table and get something of value right away. If you run it and you're surprised or, or happy about the gender assignment, just, just raise your hand and tell people, yeah. Really? How about that? How about that? I would have to agree with that too. So, um, we we actually have Kyle's at Treehouse. So yes, I actually knew that that one was weird. I don't know why. Um, fascinating. So Kyle clearly is a problem. What else? Hmm? It could be the locale. The default locale is U.S. Though, which is weird. Um, it also spits up a lot when it doesn't know a name. And so some of the newer names, like it's not so good with uh, common names now, like um, uh, Khaleesi, uh, which my wife delivers. <laughs> you, everyone laughs. You all think I'm making that up. My wife delivers babies. She, that's what she does. And she hasn't delivered one, but they keep track of like the hot names. And you would be stunned at what the hot names are. Um, so uh, we're kind of past the Cheyennes and the Shania's. That era is kind of, kind of, kind of over. Um, but it, it changes over time. This gym was first done in 2007. Um, there's some interesting things in it. The good news is it's really easy to hack the data format for it because it's basically just a big text file. Uh, how are people doing? Are people getting this to run okay that have it? I mean, if you don't have it, download it. So, yeah. Cool. Anyone else surprised, shocked, upset, disappointed to find out they're andro androgynous or mostly male or mostly female? I laugh every time I think gender assignment is what, what I mean, that's, that's just it's the wrong thing to call this. But uh, yeah, what? Uh, put down Biff, it's androgynous. Biff yeah. is androgynous, there you go. And you can see what it did for justice and, uh, ch and I didn't put in charity, um, but justice and uh, we should see what it does for Khaleesi. I think it throws up its hands and calls anything it doesn't know androgynous too. So um, you can also set the, uh, the um, there, there's some ways in the C code to set the uh, threshold for uh, saying androgynous and net androgynous. But so, um, so are we close enough? I should go on. I have no clue how to do the pulse of, of this because you know either you've got it and you can run it or you can't run it. Are we kind of yes, sir? Go ahead. I have a question. Uh, sure. So I just said a gibberish. Yep. Give me androgynous. So yep. if it doesn't know, it's just going to say androgynous. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, there's a threshold, and off the top of my head, I can't remember what it is, but it, it basically, like, it's something like if it's somewhere like 80, 85 percent sure okay. that it will say male or female. And there's this window where it's kind of sure, and it does the mostly male and mostly female. And so if you run that second file, the um, the uh, this well, I can run it. So I mean, we can at least see what's going on. If we if you do assign gender to users. Let's get a terminal up here. Uh, hang on, I know the terminal's not there yet. Oops. So if we assign gender to users, sorry, I made this bigger so you could see it and then it doesn't fit on the screen. So, it's, so if we assign gender to users oops, and run it across the, uh, the uh, database that I gave you, you know, you can see that Treehouse apparently skews pretty male, and uh, 
pretty androgynous. The androgynous is all sorts of test junk in there. Um, I did a longer write up of this, but you know, garbage in, garbage out. We have three mostly female and seven mostly male, and uh, then the whole bunch of androgynous names and just a handful of women. Um, we have one woman named Fabi who, like, it doesn't know what to do with. Um, there, there's all sorts of people it's confused about. Amy, A-I-M-E-E, -E, it uh, gets mostly female, I think. Um, but that one, it, it was having interesting times. So anyhow, gender. So what I just did is I saved you having to do a survey and having to compile the results and having to deal with the statistical sampling technique you'd have to do to backfill it enough that you felt confident that you got an overall uh, overall um, decent segment of your users so you could figure out who's male and female. Um, the problem I originally did this for was to figure out how to order t-shirts. So I want to put this in a real context. We were trying to figure out for one of the meetups how many male and female t-shirts we could do. Of course I could have counted because Treehouse only has like 70 employees. I could have counted. Um, but I thought it was a good example of figuring out how to use machine learning to do that because it let us know how many male and female t-shirts we needed. It was about 10% female t-shirts made it really easy. Um, and now if we, we literally have recently started, hey, all you Treehouse users that mentioned you're there, we've initially started, we've started sending out Treehouse users, or sorry, sending out t-shirts to people who subscribe. And we we're like, wonder how many male and female ones we need and what, would, what it would cost. Well, now we have a good idea to estimate how much that would be because we can run this against our user base, figure out how many are probably female and probably male and get good estimates on that. So hopefully that's one take home. You can assign gender to your users. Everybody cool with where we are so far? All right, so the next one also is not very sexy machine learning. This one is geolocation. I bet a ton of you do geolocation, right? People who do geolocation already from IP address for their users, a fair bit. Um, how many people use a third-party service for that? MaxMind, probably? Sorry? What else? Sorry? Cool, so there's a handful of, of companies that do it. Anyone used free geoIP? That's why, that's why I was curious. So free GeoIP is the focus of the next one. Again, it's something you get to take home. It's something you can use today. And there's real reasons for using it. Um, we wanted at uh, the, the context for this, oh, let me get ahead of my talk. Um, the context for this at Treehouse. The context was we wanted to know better what we needed to do with our support hours. We wanted to see where people were. Uh, we didn't need super accuracy, so this was a good technique for it. We just needed to know roughly how much West Coast time, how much East Coast time, how much European GMT time, what does our profile look like of our users so we knew better how to staff the support people. Again, this is gonna let us put a financial value on our users, a financial value on how much we spend on support and make sure we can use a really good way of spending money effectively to support our users, make people love us more and uh, have a really good experience. So, um, basically, our technique is very similar. We're going to select an IP address. Who, who has the IP address in their users table, right? It, it would be anyone who uses its device, right, by default that has an IP address. So almost anyone, almost any vanilla Rails app has IP address in there. A lot of other people just put IP address in there in general. Um, so free geo IP net is a service, but the code is all open source. They use two things. They use the um, the uh, MaxMind free location database, which has about 20 miles accuracy, maybe five miles accuracy, depending on where you are. It's good enough for a lot of the kind of things that people need to do. For us, we needed time zone resolution. Easy, easy enough. Um, though I guess people here in Chicago are right on the wrong edge of a time zone. And then there's the people in Indiana that are on the other edge of that time zone. So I guess maybe 20 miles does matter. So if you want to run this, you can get it all from GitHub. It needs Python and Go because it wouldn't be fun if we didn't have as many possible languages. It uses Python to pull down all the data um, from MaxBind. It then takes that data, munges it with a local CSV file that adds more information about locations and countries to it. Then you spin up a Go server. How many Go programmers we got? Awesome. So you know we spin up a Go server. And then we can use Ruby to throw uh, IP addresses at it. Seems like a lot of work. One nice thing about this is you can control it inside. You can keep it inside. You can use the data and add your own data to it to make, um, ma make the country information richer, um, to make the, uh, the uh, IP address information more rich. And you can, uh, can uh, basically have a good time with it. So the code's pretty straightforward. We're going to walk through the code, give you an opportunity to do it. Um, in my perfect world, I thought I'd sit up here and I'd just run the server so you all could hit it, so you didn't have to install Go. Pretty sure that's not going to work. 
Um, so uh, <laughs> again, it's a co conference Wi-Fi, so this might be a take it home. So basically, if we look through the code, and this is all an exercise to the location thing, this is all Ruby, right? We're going to set a geocoder, which for us is going to be localhost. We're going to use Faraday because I'm old school just to grab a uh, request. And then when we do that, we're going to grab the user. We're going to make sure it's an IP4 regular expression. That's what that little bit here does. The reason I do that is our load balancer at Treehouse was misconfigured for a while, and some of our users have um, the load balancer's IP6 data in it, both of which are problematic because A, it says it's coming from the load balancer, which has nothing to do with the user, and B, IP6 can be a problem with some of the, uh, some of the libraries. So matching it against IP6, so we're throwing away the data that's bad. Everyone following the Ruby so far? Right? Nothing rock science here. Rocket science here. Rock star. Rocket science. Going to get it straight. And then we're just going to JSON get. We're going to just grab some bodies. So we're calling that, uh, that uh, connection uh, that we set up with Faraday to get the JSON representation of the current login IP. And we're going to parse that out as some JSON data. And what that's going to give us, among other things, is a latitude and a longitude and a big JSON packet. So again, what I did is I set up a bunch of uh, data um, in the machine learning SQLite database. Uh, this runs um, against that. It throws data against a Go server, and then it stuffs the result into a new table, so you've got it. So again, we could ask people where they live. Doesn't really matter where they live if we can figure out where they live based on their IP address. Is this perfect? No, right? Um, I did a lot of geolocation work at General Assembly, and we tried to deal with things like I leave a plane in San Francisco, leave on a plane from San Francisco, and I'm going to New York. Both the places we were having, both places where we had uh, presence, and I have Wi-Fi on the plane. Should I show you New York, San Francisco, or something else? My answer was let them choose. But the answer we had internally was let's use some sort of magic to figure out where they are and try to assign them to San Francisco and New York, which we could also do as well. Anyhow, how do we do this code? You see the assign location to users. Uh, in the second exercise, it's going to look like this. And you can see that I was pretty honest about what it is. Right? One thing that's really important is this doesn't work if you're not running the Go server. So I'm going to go ahead because at least I can demo this. I'm going to run a Go server over here. Hello, there is our Go server. So we're running a Go server. We've already downloaded the data and parsed it with Python. Go is running our server here, and then we are going to go over here. Sorry, I keep saying over here, and I'm saying it too much. And we are going to go over to exercise two. We're going to make it so you can actually read this. And you're welcome to do it, right? So we're going to just Ruby. Assign location to users. It's going to go ahead and stuff a lot of users into our database. We can go see that it asked the Go server. You can see the Go server is doing its thing. Go server is wicked fast, by the way. I love this little Go server. This made me want to try Go. Um, so it's just sending a bunch of IP addresses from our database. And we're getting all the JSON location data. Now we've got latitude and longitude. So you want to take five minutes and try it? If you've got your users table, you can hook it up. How many people said they had like device or something with IP addresses? Handful. Um, just a hint, 127.0.0.1 uh, .0 doesn't geolocate, 10 dot anything doesn't geolocate, you know, all the uh, 192, 168 uh, addresses don't geolocate, the junk addresses don't geolocate. So, you know, you need to throw those out. But so, two things so far. We've got a way to assign gender to users, and we've got a way to assign location to users. So we took these guys. Maybe we turned them into these guys. So they actually are people, you know, in full color um, and uh, look like people as opposed to these vague silhouettes. And we described our users. <laughs> so that is kind of the end of Act One. Um, so let's take a couple of minutes to go ahead and see if you can get um, the geolocation running. D would it help if I wandered around? I'm not sure how useful it is because the code either runs or it doesn't because the bundle install is such a pain in the butt with the internet in here. So I'm trying to take a pulse. I'm taking a survey, which I already told you is wrong. I should just use some sort of machine learning to figure out whether I'm going fast or slow enough. I could use maybe eyeball contact or 
you know, some sort of other statistic. Um, we doing okay? Yeah. Okay. The linear algebra? Yeah. yeah. There's some. Um, I got it to work. There's a Quora post. Yep. It. Yeah, basically, you need. Did, did what you do? Who, who was saying? You were saying that. You were Kyle. Yep. See, I already. Kyle is already a person to me because we, we uh, used the gender assignment thing to make sure he was male. I'm going to guess he's from the Pacific Northwest and be wrong. Uh, no? No. Okay, good. Okay. I was. <laughs> Oh, thanks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it, I try. I was going to put it on like uh, memory sticks, but I can't put Go on a memory stick in a way that installs. I can't put all the C libraries. It, it's we, when we get to the conclusion, you'll see why um, we chose this and what some of the options are. But the question that I was looping back to, it's probably that. Oops, sorry. It's probably this Quora post. Well, anyhow, I got the Quora post here, but what it turns into is probably the installing the build, the build uh, F to C. So you can install that if you can get an internet connection. That'll probably let the linear algebra gem to compile. Because since we're doing Polyglot, remember we've done Ruby, we've done Python, we've done Go, we've done C with Sex Machine, and now we're adding Fortran to the mix because this is taking a Ruby library and using C bindings to take the, um, the uh, Fortran C bindings and plug it all together um, because that is how you win. How many people have ever used Fortran any time in their life? Wow. Wow. I am, so, I mean, really used Fortran, not used it under the hood, right? You know, and so, yeah. Um, Fortran was my second, third, third programming language. Um, Side project, yeah, everybody should pick a Fortran side project. I, I totally agree with that. Okay, so um, we've got about 45 minutes to get through the second half. How are people doing with the geolocation? They're just fine because like no one has Go and they can't run Go and we don't have any internet in here and I can't run things, so okay to move on? All right, so if you leave now, you have taken two useful things, hopefully. You can do the, the gender assignment of your users, you can do the location, and you can find out more about your users, hopefully in a useful way. We're going to start, well, I, I always get ahead of my slides. Hang on. I'll shut up till I have a slide to talk from. So we're past this point. So now we're going to stories of myth and legend. We're going to take stories that were simple, you know, who you are. Tell me about yourself. Tell me uh, your gender. Tell me your, uh, your location. Tell me the normal things you say when you're introducing yourself to somebody or telling a story about yourself. Now we're going to do something crazy. Um, I put this here, there be dragons, because I knew, I knew we were going to have trouble with linear algebra. I knew we were going to have trouble with compilation. I knew we were going to have trouble with Wi-Fi. So, you know, all these things are a problem. Dragons can be scary, right? Um, so Smaug, right, from The Hobbit is pretty freaking scary with Benjamin Cumberbatch, but they're not always scary. Um, who knows what this movie is? Yeah, a handful of people know it's Pete's Dragon. I did not add anything to that. It looks like he's holding a ruby. And that just came straight off Google Docs, and that let me know I was on the right path. Because there are dragons at the edge of the map, right? And we are at the edge of the ruby map. And we want to have less him that's you know, eating us and more him who is our friend um, as we get here at the end of the map um, of, of what ruby can do. So we've been looking at how people can be described. So, you know, here we've got a whole bunch of people, and now we can describe them a little better. We can put an agenda on them. We can put a location on them. But the next step is to put people into clusters, to put people into groups, because we form tribes naturally. You know, that's the people telling the stories around the campfire. Um, myths grow up around uh, groups of people and individuals, right? But people agglomerate towards those, uh, towards those people. And this is a random grouping of people. But you look at that and you're like, there's some order. You know, I mean, you can see clusters in there. You can argue about how you draw the cluster. You know, I could draw the cluster and say, here's a cluster of people. Someone else might say, here's the cluster of people. You know, someone else might say, well, that's a really good cluster. And this is just some weird shaped cluster. But it doesn't matter. Visually, you can look at that and you can say, OK, some of those people are not like the other people. They're grouped differently. And your users are like that, too. Um, when, when we're looking at, at users, we often use that giant Google Analytics pile of, of aggregates, right? 
And, you know, Batman was slapping us for using aggregates because they don't tell the whole story. So what we can do is we can take important properties about your users, whatever those are. I'm going to do it in a, a sort of a treehouse context. Um, but you can figure out whatever your important properties are. And we're going to find ways to see the inherent structure there and to find ways to find similarity there. Those are the two things we're going to do. So this is where we get into math, too. Before I go into how many people had linear algebra in the past? Okay, all of that was because you were computer science majors, right? And they made you do it. Okay. So linear algebra is, is fascinating and underlines all this. Um, linear algebra is very easy to do wrong. I've got one thing here that's done kind of by hand, and then we're going to use this wonderful library, the uh, AI for R, the Artificial Intelligence for Ruby gem, is chock full of uh, clustering algorithms and ID3 decision trees and all sorts of wonderful. So you don't have to do it by hand. Um, but it relies on the linear algebra gem. Anyhow, we're going to take important properties from our users. We're going to use either by hand or we're going to use this gem. And we're going to do stuff with it. So here is a specific example. At Treehouse, we treat all our users pretty much the same. But it would not be out of the ordinary to think maybe we have kind of casual users. We maybe have professional users. And then we have the crazy people that earn every single badge we have and 25,000 points and all that. You know, we got our super users. We got normal users. We got casual users. That's a hypothesis. Let's, you know, we could find out if that's true. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to use a technique called um, k-means clustering. We'll define it in a second. But basically, it's a way of saying, I want to take all this data and put it into a particular number k of groups. So I'm not clustering, you know, about, uh, about until, so, let me rewind. I'm saying I know how many clusters I want. I want three. I want five. I want 10. The example I'm using right now is three. I want to break into what I think are casual users, um, super users, and, uh, and professional users, let's say. What you'll find if you do a lot of machine learning is you will take a lot of those assumptions and you'll try it with three, four, five, seven, and 10 or something like that and see if the results make sense because you don't know. This algorithm, much like a lot of statistics, you make assumptions at the beginning and then you uh, have to kind of stick with them all the way through the end. So for k-means clustering, we're going to figure out k clusters. We're going to put these users into groups and we're going to see what we can learn from them. So I want to talk through some code. If you look in the ex3, uh, the example three uh, folder in the repo, I'm going to just pull bits and pieces out of the... Uh, out of the clustering, the first clustering. So I'm going to make some clusters. So like I said, for our example, we're going to do three. So I'm going to do three clusters. We don't have to know what a cluster is. A cluster is just a, a group. And then I'm going to take all of my users, and I'm just going to, going to, uh, going to uh, modulo them by k. So I end up with randomly sprinkling them. So if the visual of this is I'm taking all of my users, and I'm just throwing them out on the floor in any random order. That's what I'm doing. And the value I'm going to use, I chose to use uh, the, bird, the, the number of uh, badges people have earned at Treehouse because I think the badges has a correlation with whether these people are power users or casual users or stuff. At Treehouse, you get a badge for finishing a significant chunk of work, basically. So I'm going to use badges as the one thing I'm going to measure. I can use way more than one, but it's easier to work with one. I'm going to just basically throw the people out on the floor. Don't really care how they're organized because I'm going to try to find some order in there. And then I'm going to go on to uh, the actual math math of it. So um, I'm basically going to, for each person, I'm going to find the center of each cluster. Remember, I started with three clusters, kind of threw them all out randomly. People are in these clusters. I'm going to figure out the center, basically. So I'm going to figure out the center using some mysterious math. And then for each person, I'm going to go through all the other clusters and see if they're closer to another cluster than they are to the one they're in, the center of it. So basically, when I'm looking at all these people on the floor, I find three visual points that are centers. And then, if someone's kind of like hanging way out here on the edge between this one and this one, the person out on the edge probably really belongs over here. And so I'm going to put them over there. And I'm going to do that for each person. And then, when that's done, I'm going to do it again. But I'm going to calculate new centers for everything. And so what that's going to do is eventually it will stop moving. People will sort themselves out to the closest center. The center will move a little, and it will kind of separate people out slowly. It's really cool to see the visualization. It's really hard to do the visualization in Ruby. Um, so I've got a text, a text visualization. But I'm just basically going to keep doing that till it's done. 
Um, and at the end of that, I'm going to have three groups. And then I can look at the statistics of those three groups. So um, you might wonder what calculate GD is. Calculate GD is calculate the geometric, geometric distance. So you'll find for all of these algorithms, calculating the distance is the one true thing that uh, differs between them. There's all sorts of ways to do it. I'm using a geometric distance, which is kind of, you know, if, if you want to think about it like a hypotenuse, there's Manhattan distance, which is like blocks in Manhattan where you never take a diagonal because there's a building there. There's all sorts of ways to do these things. And that's when, when uh, you know, the linear algebra pays off to know some and to understand the bits and pieces. So anyhow, we've got the assigning users to a segment. Um, just curious, how many people actually have the linear algebra gem installed? And it's, it's probably like 10 or 12 of you, right? Okay, so I'm going to show it up here. Feel free to go ahead and do it, but I'm going to give you an idea of how this actually works. Um, so we've got, we can close off our Go server because we don't need it anymore. We can close off this. We can look at this. We're going to go ahead and open. The, uh, what is this? This is the um, cluster. All right, so if you skim through the code, you can see there's our calculate centroid and there's, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's some math. Um, math is not very complicated. This is all square root math. And this is basically just what I said we we're doing earlier when I went through all those bits and pieces. I put in a bunch of really ugly puts so we can see what's happening. And it'll make sense when I run it, so I'll just shut up and run it. So I'm going to see if it looks three. And I'm going to pull this over so you can see it. And you'll see there's two different gems in here. Or sorry, there's uh, two different uh, files in here. One's doing it with AI for R. So basically what that does is that hides all the details. It does k-means. You don't have to derive anything. You don't have to do any math. It's wonderful. Um, I'll tell you the first time I saw it, just as an aside clustering, I was at Le Comte last year in Paris, and um, Tamer uh, did a uh, machine learning thing where he basically said eight people sit at a table, fill out this survey, I will assign you based on machine learning to tables because there are, in ta or there are K tables. Each table can have so many people at it. And he basically used a version of this kind of clustering to figure out who should sit with who based on some interesting questions. Um, most people ended up just sitting where they wanted to, but it was an interesting experiment. Um, <laughs> And he did not use the linear algebra gem, and the code was really, really hard to understand. So if you think the linear algebra is hard to understand, um, doing it by hand is just horrible. So anyhow, enough slamming on that. So we're going to assign users to segment. And so a bunch of stuff happened. So I want to talk through it, and I couldn't think of a better, bigger way. So remember, we th basically threw all these users out onto the floor. And so we're going through each cluster that we assign them to. We initially assign them to a cluster, and we're calculating the center of each cluster. And then for each person, we look at all the other clusters and see if we should move them from the one they're in to one that is geometric distance-wise closer to them. So you can see we moved a lot of people around from, cl from cluster 0 to 1 or 2 because they were closer. And then we went to cluster 1, and we did the same thing. And then we went through cluster 2, and then you say it says iterate again. We're just starting again because we went through one pass of all the clusters, move people around, and we iterated again, and we you know, kind of skimmed through all these iterations. And then at the end, you can see what happened. The, the movements got smaller, right? There were more and more people in the right cluster and fewer and fewer people that were, were needing to get moved, and so eventually nobody moved. And it said, okay, we're in a steady state, let's stop. So. What I did then is I spit out the cluster to see how many people were in each, each group. And because badge count was what was important to me, I wanted to see what the badge average was. So um, out of the, uh, there were not quite 200 people. I'm sorry, I don't remember. We can add it up how many people were in this. So 61 people were in cluster zero, and they had an average of 12 badges. And if you look at what the badges are, this is, like I said, the world's worst visualization because it's text. But it was easier to do it this way in Ruby. Um, so you can see, you know, you're like, OK. Oh, well, you know, they're all not too many. They don't have too many badges. I could buy that. And you look at this one. Well, this cluster, you know, has an average of 51. There's a lot fewer people in it. There's 30 in this one. And you look at it, and just intuitively, you're kind of like, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you know, 56, 39, 40. All right. You know, just like we looked at the picture earlier, and we can intuitively say, here's a cluster, and here's a cluster. And the edges might be a little foggy, but they're good enough. And then when we get down to the third cluster, our third cluster is like all the people with crazy mini badges. 
Um, so, and this is all staff. We have students with tons more, but this average, the centroid was around 150. So we had clusters that were really well separated. The first one was like 12, the second one was, uh, was uh, what was it, 48, um, and the last one's 150. What was the second one? 51 and 150. So we have really good separation here. And so maybe we do have three clusters of users. I can run this again and cluster into five users. I'll probably believe the clusters it comes out. You know, I also can put more dimensions in here. It's easy to think about in two dimensions. It gets weirder to think about when it gets multidimensional. That's what I did in the next example. I put in not only their total badges, but how many points they earned for each one of our 10 major areas, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, because I was like, maybe we have clusters of people. It stands to reason JavaScript and CSS go together if you're in HTML if you're learning that. And maybe they're different from Ruby because Ruby's over here. And you know, there's overlap between the skills, but they're probably different people. And the people that are taking WordPress are probably really different from those people too, but they probably take some HTML time too. So <laughs> what I did with the next one is I used um, the gym to make life easier. Well, actually, sorry. So linear algebra is all about matrices and vectors. Under the hood, that's all matrices and vectors. Um, you already do a lot with sets, which are kind of like matrices and vectors if you know SQL. Um, as we're finding, there are way more better numerical tools than Ruby, okay? Um, Ruby is good to get your feet wet. Ruby's good to do some basic stuff. Um, Python, of course, is, is the king for doing numerical programming, and that's okay. It's okay to have something that's different. R is crazy. Um, R has been around forever. It's like strangely like Lisp in some ways, which, you know, Lisps are hot right now, and it's weird to think R is sort of like that, but there's some things about scope, yeah? Um, what about MATLAB? How does that I was getting ready to say that. So not only MATLAB, but there's an open source MATLAB called Octave, which I didn't know about um, until I just started, uh, I, I took that Stanford machine learning class to see what it was, that big giant MOOC on Coursera. And they now pretty much standardize on Octave, which is just as hostile as MATLAB, but $2,000 cheaper. So, um, I mean, I used to do MATLAB and Mathematica way back when I, when I was a, a chemist, because um, those were the languages, or the platforms, tools of, uh, of uh, quantum physics and stuff like that. But, so R, Python, um, Octave or MATLAB, Mathematica, there are tools that are really good at this, and they all have strengths and weaknesses. Just like, uh, for instance, um, R is memory bound. So it's really great. There, there are some weird ways around the memory binding of it, but if you have a 16 gig data set, you need like 16 gigs to, well, you need more to get everything to run, but you have to have enough memory to store your stuff. R is weird. Um, I'll, mo most other languages manage, okay? Ruby's probably pretty bad when you get up there too. And I was just gonna say one more thing about k-means. I should have started with this. So, um, you know, I highlighted all the fun words, vector quantization, partition in observations into k clusters, which is what we did. We had in users, k clusters, nearest mean. My favorite word after, out of that is Voroni cells, um, which sounds like, you know, some sort of, of uh, science fiction something. Apparently he's a mathematician from the 1800, late 1800s who did computational geography, so, or geometry, computational geometry. So those are Voroni cells. So that's apparently what we just worked with. All right, so the, the next example is where we talk about the alternatives to k-means. So there are other clustering tools. So basically it's the same thing. I've got a bunch of users, I'm throwing them out on the floor, and I'm gonna try to put them together. What we did before is we arbitrarily chose three centers because we put people into three groups, and then we moved them to the closest one. Hierarchical clustering is kind of cool. What it does is it starts everybody off as their own cluster. So there's in clusters, and then it looks to see if which two clusters are closest, and the two closest clusters get merged together. So it kind of agglomerates up, and then it stops when it gets to the number of clusters you say, or to the distance between the clusters. There's two different ways to have stop conditions. So um, if you look in the, uh, the AI for our example I've got in there, we're using something called complete linkage. There are 11 different kinds of linkages, which are basically the way to measure the distance in the AI for our gym, and they will all give you slightly different results. There are different ways to agglomerate the users up and measure distance in between them. The other way is to do it in reverse. The devices hierarchical clusterer starts with one cluster and then plucks the person that's furthest out into a new one, and then keeps doing that till it settles down and no people keep getting moved. So all of these work through similar techniques. The differences are whether they, uh, whether they agglomerate, divide or kind of like scatter 
and pull together. And the big difference is how they measure distance. You might say, since they're all giving us different answers, what's the point of this? Well, in any sort of machine learning problem, what you're doing is you're traversing this multidimensional space and trying to find a minima. And there's local minima and there's global minima, and the goal is to get to the best answer in a reasonable amount of time. And all these tools are different ways to approach that. You probably won't see too many differences. I ran the uh, linkages, and you can do it too. You can just change the name of the linkage. That's the AI for Jim. The AI for our gym is great. You can say complete linkage, simple linkage. You know, you just go through all the clusters and see how it changes your data. It'll change the averages a little. It'll change the clusters a little, but it probably won't change your conclusions all that much, which is what's really interesting. And if it does, it's probably because there was a, a local minima. All the things got stuck in except the, uh, the one that was different. So anyhow, alternatives to k-means. This is all in the AI for our gym. And flipping back over. Prize pretty cool, right, to be able to dig into this and see what's really going on. Um, so AI for R, uh, in Pleat, linear algebra is worth installing the Linalge gym just for getting AI for R, because it doesn't just have clusters. If you want to do ID3 decision trees and get your feet wet with that, if you want to get your feet wet with neural networks, which I got to say are a pain in the ass to program. I mean, having started years and years ago, the back propagation algorithm is like one of the most complicated algorithms to implement, which is why you want a library to do it. Because if you're trying to make money from your users, the last thing you want is to like use the wrong algorithm. You're going through enough effort to get all the data together and get the data clean and get the data into the system and figure out how the heck to run this stuff. You don't want a bad algorithm on top of that. So there are far smarter people than me that do these algorithms, and I am very happy to steal their algorithms. Same thing happens in uh, MATLAB and Octave. There are libraries that do these, that minimize functions. Awesome. It's good to know how it works, but it's much better to take it and use it to learn about your users and make money instead of learning how to do a new numerical simulation. Um, because they are, they, unless you love numerical programming. If you love numerical programming, that's fine. So, this AI for our gym, we grab the users, we put them in a data set, and you can see right here, here's the money shot. So the cluster, we're using complete linkage, and we're telling complete linkage that we want a data set with three clusters. I mean, how much easier is than that? You know, I mean, there's no figuring out what the algorithms are, there's no figuring out the geometric di difference, there's no math. Um, all the math is under the hood. And then we can spit out data about it. So I use this one um, to do complete linkage, on the same data set, and we get slightly different answers than we did before. And you're welcome to do this for the 12 of you that managed to get this uh, installed. Okay, so this data is just pure, pure, just awful. Um, but if you look at it, this is the one I want to do. So we used two different things in here if we dig under the code. One, I did the same badge exercise. Same people with badges. This one came out kind of different than the other one did. There are a lot fewer people in the top one. And I, could have cal I should have calculated the average. I think the average is probably a little lower for the second group, which is weird. And a lot more people are in the bottom group. Does that change our analysis much? I'm not sure. You know, if I was trying to figure out how many badges you have to be to be a you know, super user up there in group three, the other one said 150, the average here is like 200, I'd probably err on the, size of one on the side of 150 because I'd rather call more people super users than less super users. But either way, I know that I have this group of people and it's a fairly rarefied group compared to the big group of people down here. And if I'm really focused on marketing, maybe what I want to do is try to figure out how to get more of these people up there. And I know that, you know, Somewhere there's this magic point between 30 or 40 badges and up around 100 where they jump from one group to another. What can I do to figure out how people get from that one group to another? The stuff down here at the bottom is I used something even more incomprehensible. I put in all of their per point earnings in the 10 major categories. That's why there's 10 chunks of data here. So that's saying I don't care about your total points. I care about the point distribution among word perfect. Sorry, word perfect. That, gets, that just dates me. Whenever I see WP, I think word perfect because it's just built into my DNA and it means WordPress where we are, which never crosses my mind as a tool I'd use. So sorry to the WordPress people. Anyhow, uh, WordPress, design, PHP, HTML, JS, CSS, that's what all these numbers are, how many points people are. So I was digging down into the points. This is still pretty incomprehensible, but you can see we have groups of people you know, that 
based on their points, we could say, well, what do we know about those points? We could start aggregating the bits and pieces. We could throw this on a visualization, which would help a ton, because this just looks like vomit. And um, yeah, so now we've done two different kinds of grouping. If I want to change this from complete linkage to simple linkage, or one of the other ones that's supported by IFRR, I change you know, that one line of code to use the different linker. And I see if my results change significantly. So now, we've done the first of our really nasty um, sets of uh, data analytics. We, we've um, worked with the different kinds of clustering algorithms to take our users and to segment them in different ways. I mean, we described them. We said they're male or female. We said where they're from. We could have used that as input into here. We could have said male or female, latitude, longitude, cluster, and like that. Maybe we have a big female following in the UK at Treehouse. That would be an interesting piece of data to know. Maybe we have a huge male following in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, I think that's probably a given with the subject matter that we have, but who knows again? That would be fun stuff to find out. I was interested in badges, and so that's what we were starting to dig out. And um, you know, visualizing this is uh, kind of best used. Um, if people use things like D3 or I guess you could use some of the, the ggplot things. Some of this ends up for me going into R, so I use some of the R tools to show it off. So, but this lets us get Ruby results pretty quickly. You saw that that one ran for a little longer, though. There was a definite pause when that one ran. It was taxing my little MacBook Air here a lot. Final thing, you all are troopers for dealing with the, uh, the Wi-Fi situation and the linear algebra compilation problems. What we're going to do in the last bit, getting back to the talks, talk about likes, things that are like each other, um, talk about similarity. So um, again, I'm interested in how people collaborate, how people um, recommend things to one, to one another, how people uh, find people who are similar to them. And everybody here, I, I would bet, at some point has used something like Netflix or something similar that tells you what you're going to like based on how you've rated movies or how you've rated purchases or something like that. So. Again, we're starting with important properties, like before we were using badges or point totals. This is pure linear algebra and this magic thing called SVD. Um, so single value decomposition. Uh, it's one of a handful of um, techniques for simplifying complex matrices. And so basically, the gist of SVD is you have users and ratings of something. You know, you're, all the users, all the movies, and I think I'm going to do something out of order here and give you a visual. So basically, we're going to come back to how the math got calculated here. But basically, what we're doing is we're taking all the Netflix users and all the movies. Imagine how huge that matrix is, you know, just in, in your mind, just this giant matrix. And we're collapsing it down using math into a two-dimensional space. Um, there are very clear uh, proofs you can do if you care about uh, linear algebra proofs, they make my head explode, so I'm willing to trust the people that are much smarter than me that, uh, that have done the math. But basically, we're going to summarize everybody onto a board like this. And then we're going to take someone new, Bob in this example, we're going to throw Bob on the board by taking this greatly reduced simplification um, that SVD gives us, putting Bob through a mathematical process and put him on this board and then see who he's similar to. And we're going to use something called cosine similarity, which basically measures the angle um, that, uh, that Bob has from the origin and finds people that are very close to the line that he draws. So that line from the origin through Bob says this is Bob's space of what Bob likes, um, or a good approximation of it. And we find the closest people and say, oh, well, Ben and Fred are probably really good people to use to recommend things to him. So we. I mean, that's amazing if you think about taking giant sets of users and ratings and collapsing it down into something where we can just throw Bob in against one simple matrix, spit out a number, and do a, a distance calculation. It's amazing how that works. Um, it, it is nuts. So this also looks like the terminal vomited a bit. Um, we're going to uh, make matrices in the linear algebra. I'm going to run through this real quick. Um, the, the key part is right here, uh, mu, sigma, and v transpose. That's why those are named like they are, even though later on I transpose the vt transpose. The magic happens here. There's actually a single value decomposition method in the linear algebra gym. That's why you want it, because it saves you having to do matrix math by hand, because matrix math by hand is just stunningly nasty as that LeConf exercise that Tamer did would demonstrate. Um, so 
what that does is that basically ends up giving you um, a, uh, ju just a two-dimensional representation of this giant matrix. And the, the single value decomposition theorem is that uh, you can take a matrix and any matrix can be decomposed into the, the mu, the sigma, and the, the V transpose. You know, magic, magic, magic happens, and then you end up extracting a two-dimensional um, space from it, and now you can magically apply users. It's a black box, right? And unless you're writing the code for it, you don't really care about that black box. So, um, so uh, I, I hate to belittle the fact that there's really complex math in there and that, you know, it should be invisible, but it should be invisible because you, you don't care about that. You care about the users. You just want it right. Anyhow, so we're going to use that magical single value decomposition method to get out the matrices we want. Then we're going to flatten it into 2D space because a theorem says we can. And then we're going to take Bob. We're going to put Bob's values, A or Bob's values. We're going to turn Bob into a matrix. And then we're going to multiply them by the bits and pieces that we extracted from that other matrix using math. And then we're going to use more matrix math to uh, magically calculate the uh, cosine similarity um, by using normalized matrices and matrices dot transpose. And I'm just going to hand wave from there. I mean, I can sort of follow the math, but um, that's the magic of SVD. And then you end up with being able to loop through all the users um, that are similar to Bob and decide who's similar enough to him to recommend him. So we end up here. So I'm going to run through this real quick, and then we will wrap up and talk about questions. SVD is the one that, is, um, that I do least, as you can probably tell. We don't do a lot of recommendations at Treehouse. Um, so everything I've done with SVD is, is kind of kind of more, uh, what's the best way to put it, more exploratory. Um, what am I thinking of? Hang on. That's what it is. So what I'm doing, again, is to figure out similar users, I'm trying to figure out, based on the points they've earned in various courses, who would be most, like, what course we should recommend to people based on who they are most similar to, whether we should put more of them in HTML, put them more in a CS track, put them more in a Ruby track, an iOS track, what have you. And the easiest way is probably just to run it. So we're going to get rid of this. We're going to sit over there. And we are going to Ruby. OK. So um, what we're doing, oops, it's a little off screen. What we're doing is we're taking all the users, and we use the same users for all of these things. Oh, it wrapped. That's what it did. Sorry. And you'll see one line. A bunch of our users in this test set never earned anything. They're mostly test users. And if you put zeros in, zeros blow up to not a number, and zeros are useful for recommendations, because how could someone who's never done anything give you a valid recommendation? So there's math and logic reasons for throwing them out. So we've got 85 users left. We're going to get Bob's point scores. Those are actually my point scores on Treehouse, um, because like I said, I do a lot of our exercises. And then I'm going to find all the similar users. I like that the most similar user in one way is an unsubscribed user from our test database. That made me, <laughs> that made me laugh. We've got 0.999 similarity. Um, and you know, here's another user down here that's got 0.997. Uh, Fasan, who runs our conference programs, is 996. Demo Demo is pretty similar to me. That's, that's, that's great. And our, uh, for some reason, our guy who does finance is really similar to me, um, which surprised me, because he basically does accounts. I didn't actually knew know he had ever earned <coughs> points. So that was exciting. And honestly, I don't know who Luke is. So I think Luke is an old employee or fake looking at those, uh, those scores. Anyhow, um, so I put in my scores. I wanted to find the people that are similar. You see, I have a whole bunch of zeros for tracks I haven't done. And the goal here is what tracks should I do next? Because um, the SVD is best at, at saying, if you haven't done this, this is one you'd like. And unsubscribed user is the most similar to me. And it's suggesting I start JavaScript, CSS, or WordPerfect. Joking, I know it's WordPress. Um, so it's suggesting that those are the tracks I should start in order of which one is probably the one that I would like most. And now I know that I could tell the user, hey, JS track might be where you want to go next based on what you've done and the recommendations of all of our users. So SVD, we doing good? 
I give you a minute to run it, but I know linear algebra gem is just going to blow up for everybody who doesn't have it installed, and you can run it whenever you want now, which is awesome too. So to wrap up, um, the goal was Ruby to answer questions about your users and your business. And I want to make sure you left with some tools because you gave up two, two slots and seen Sandy talk to watch this. Um, and fought with linear algebra and fought with Wi-Fi and we're back here in the furthest part of the dungeon in the basement that was possible. Um, so I wanted to make sure you had something useful to take out of here. So, you know, I keep thinking about a black box and there are good black boxes and there are black, bad black boxes. A lot of the machine learning for our intents and purposes, especially if you're a Ruby person, can be a black box. You don't have to know the details of SVD if you can get it implemented right. You don't have to know how, the, uh, how a neural network back propagation algorithm works or an ID3 decision tree works if you can find one and use it. You have to know what the goal of it is and you, know, you have to know what the, the foundation of what kinds of questions you can ask with it, but you don't actually have to implement the math. Um, and that's good because the math isn't what's exciting unless you work at MATLAB. Um, the, mat, the math is what gets you to having a better plan, right? Because we go back to our friends, you know, the underpants gnomes that were at the very beginning. A lot of times we've got all these users in our table and there's gotta be a way to make more money from them. Um, Treehouse, we had a really interesting discussion about how to increase uh, ARPS, our average revenue per subscriber, because we have two plans. What's the, what's the best way to increase your average revenue per subscriber if you're a subscription-based business? Anybody? Raise the price, thank you. So after that got shot down, um, <laughs> we, we have multiple tiers, we have silver and gold, and the goal was to get, the only way ARPS can go up if you can't raise the price is to move people from the lower tier to the higher tier. And so the goal was to figure out what we can do to move people from a lower tier where they're paying a lower value, a lower amount per month to a higher tier. And so the way to start with that was figure out more information about our higher tier users. Our, we're, we're transitioning from calling them from gold to pro and I'm not sure which they are now, but so our gold or pro users versus our basic sil silver users, how do we get people to move from one to the other? And before we can do that, we need to understand more about them. I mean, we can offer discounts, we can treat them as a big agglomerated mess of people who are all the same, or we can treat them individually. And the kinds of individual treatment we were doing, we were looking at the male-female ratios. You know, do women and men do it the same way as far as silver and gold? Um, do, uh, does time zone make a difference? Um, because, you know, foreign countries, we have far fewer people in gold, for instance. So it was fascinating. And the goal at the end of all this, right, was to use some black boxes, right, to have a better business plan so we can roll in money because rolling in money is usually what the goal is that keeps you employed and um, that that is what I hope the tools that you have from this can kind of help you get started with real quick I'm gonna do credits and then I'll do questions so thanks to the rails comp team which is awesome for having me do this Jeff runs the workshops if you don't know Jeff G school is sorry Turing IO is awesome it's also where Katrina works they're great people um, I work at Treehouse. I have um, all sorts of Treehouse stickers, three different kinds up here. Um, I like taking the train, so uh, I ended up here coding a lot on the train on the way out here. Thank you, Amtrak. And that is my contact info, which will come back up, no worries. Real quick recommendations, because people always ask where to look and what to do with stuff. O'Reilly has great data science books, um, and they go on sale fairly regularly. And they also have something called the Data Science Toolkit, which is like five books or seven books. I forget however many it is that go on sale pretty regularly. So they, and I think all these are in it. Um, none of them talk about Ruby. <laughs> so just be prepared, right? Because Ruby is not the optimal language for this, but you can read about SVD in one of these books and then go implement it or use one of the implementations of it in Ruby. You can read about what an ID3 uh, decision tree looks like and then come back and do it in Ruby. So these books are certainly have their place and these are some of the ones I found most useful. Um, I also really like Lean Analytics um, from the, the Lean Startup series. Even better, if you like more class-oriented stuff, um, Coursera, that one on the far left is Stanford's uh, well-known machine learning class, which is brutal, um, uses Octave, teaches you Octave, which is kind of open source MATLAB. Um, and uh, this week is actually back propagation, so I'm taking my pass um, because I'm here at RailsConf from doing the homework this week. Um, and uh, Coursera has a couple other ones. John Hopkins has a whole data science 
theme. Um, the first one is a gimme for anybody that's interested in it because basically by the end of it, you've put a markdown document on GitHub. So for most Ruby people, the bar is pretty low for the first class. Then it's intro to R, then it's data scraping and cleaning, and then it gets into using R to do stuff. There's like nine parts. It's one of the specializations they offer so they can actually get money. Um, so for like 500 bucks, you can get a certificate. For zero dollars, you can take the same stuff and do the same homework and get all the same learning. That horrible, horrible, horribly come uh, uh, partly copied uh, image there is the try R thing. Code School has a try R that they did in association with O'Reilly. So R is worth it just to um, appreciate Ruby and to try a Lisp and to uh, actually be able to do some really, really elegant mathematical calculations and plot some really horrible graphs. So all those are tools of the trade. You'll see them. Um, and then that's me. Um, I would happily ask, answer questions. You can hit me up on Twitter where you know, I may or may not respond because I only Twitter at conferences. I will um, be around today, tomorrow. I'll sit in here. We can try to get the linear algebra gem installed if you're really upset that we couldn't do it. It's really internet related for the most part and then the F2C thing. So today, Fortran, C, Python, Go, Ruby, right? And then you also um, can go home with users that you can figure out their gender, figure out their location, and then one day when you get the uh, linear algebra gem finally installed for real, you can go ahead and uh, do uh, either SVD or K-means clustering. K-means is so fun. I mean, it's ridiculous to talk about math like that. I love seeing what you can do with crazy clusters. Um, you wanna cluster your people into 100? All right, what happens? What, what do you find from that? Clustering them into two groups? Wow, I didn't ever know that. Cluster them on crazy things? like uh, points earned and how long they've been a member. Doesn't seem so crazy. Maybe there is a correlation there. All sorts of cool things you can do with it. So I hope it was worthwhile. Thanks for skipping Sandy to do this. Thanks for skipping the other slot. I'm answering questions. Thank That's me. Thank you.